Thank you very much, Dennis. Thank you for the introduction. And a special thank you as well to, to be able to, to do this presentation to you today. So as Dennis mentioned, uh, we will be looking at a South African biocontrol perspective. So firstly, uh, I will give a brief introduction, looking at a few aspects around South Africa and the agricultural sector in the country. Then um, a short introduction on the South African Bioproducts Organization or SABO. After that, we'll be having a quick look at the biocontrol market in South Africa, what's going on at this stage, and then going on to a bit more challenging topic, which is regulatory, looking at Act 36 of 1947, and then bioremedies, uh, which pertains to, to uh, biocontrol products. And then I will uh, summarize the, the whole uh, presentation in a short summary. Now, if we move on and start with an introduction, uh, maybe for our international friends, let's take a look at South Africa as a country. Now, South Africa has got a surface area of approximately 1.2 million square kilometers. Uh, we've got quite a broad range of coastal lines as well. Um, there's nine provinces in South Africa, including Limpopo province in the north, uh, Gauteng, which is the economic hub of the country, yeah, in the top center, a very small uh, province in terms of surface area, but uh, very densely populated. Then there's uh, Mpumalanga on the eastern side, uh, the northwest province in the uh, northwesterly regions of the country. Then you've got the Free State in the center, uh, Guizuri Natal in the eastern coastal parts, and then the Northern Cape, which is uh, one of the largest provinces in South Africa with regard to surface area, but sparsely populated compared to, to, other, um, to other regions. Uh, it's also a very arid region of the country. And then you've got the, the Eastern Cape on the Eastern part, and then finally the Western Cape, uh, where Cape Town is situated. Now the population density uh, for 2021 is estimated at just over 60 million people. Uh, nominal GDP uh, by 2019 was in the area of 251.4 billion US dollars. Currency, of course, is the South African Rand. And as you can see from this Koppen Geiger climate classification, South Africa is mostly semi arid, but we've got some subtropical. Uh, areas along the East Coast as well. Um, but what makes South Africa great is mm -hmm. the diversity in its climatic regions and uh, the, the, the nature of the country really is, uh, is wonderful. If we move on to the agricultural sector, now South Africa has really got a strong agricultural sector and there's especially a major drive towards export markets. During the first half of 2021, South Africa's agricultural exports amounted to the region of 6.1 billion US dollars. Now for the 2020-21 season, that's approximately 30% year on year increase. However, one should really take that with a, with a pinch of salt since the base effects really needs to be considered. The first half of 2020 was heavily affected by COVID-19 related disruptions to the global supply chains. Um, but it still gives a good idea of the potential growth that South Africa has with regard to agricultural exports. Now export crops con uh, contributes considerably to the country's GDP. And it's also uh, a large source of job creation as well. Now, South Africa, cultivates a variety of crops um, and several of these crops are exported to international markets. Some of the top export crops include citrus, apples and pears, grapes, nuts, pineapples, avocados and other subtropical fruit including lychees and mangoes. Of course wine is also a major export uh, commodity and then in South Africa, there's also a wide variety of vegetables, grain crops, uh, both winter and summer grains, legume crops also produced in South Africa. And then on the industrial crop side, we've got tobacco and cotton, 
However, at this stage, tobacco is seeing some severe pressure uh, with a reduction in, uh, pro uh, uh, in production and planting securing at this stage. What's interesting is cotton that's actually increasing over the last few seasons. Um, cotton was in a long time ago a fairly strong uh, crop in South Africa. It reduced quite significantly in uh, a few years ago, but it seems to be growing again. So that's a, a very good sign for the cotton industry. Now, if we look at uh, the areas where um, crops are cultivated in South Africa, again, this is a very simplistic view. Um, South Africa's got a very wide range of areas and regions where a, a huge number of crops are being cultivated. But you will find your a very strong concentration of fruits and especially export fruit, uh, palm fruit, stone fruit, uh, uh, wine grapes, table grapes and citrus in your in your Western Cape areas as, as, as well as canola, wheat and potatoes. Um, the Eastern province, of course, has also got a wide variety, uh, whether it's grain crops, whether it's citrus, whether it's potatoes. Up in uh, or the North, uh, Northern Cape, which is a relatively arid province, has got uh, also in several regions potato, potato uh, cultivation as well as uh, grapes. And there's increasing um, hectares of nuts also being planted in the Northern Cape regions, especially around Canon Island. And then uh, the central part, especially the Free State, is a very important uh, production area for South Africa, especially with regard to maize, uh, sunflower, potato, soybean and wheat. But there's also a small uh, number of um, uh, apple hectares also being cultivated, uh, especially near the Bethlehem uh, region. Then the Northwest, also important for cereal crops, uh, again, Soybeans, very interestingly, are expanding westwards, especially with new cultivars being developed. Uh, so that's very, very good news. And then it's also a very good maize producing region, as well as some sunflower. The Highfeld region, especially the, the Highfeld from Gauteng to Pumalanga, is an extremely important region as well, especially with regard to soybean and maize. And then the northern regions are very important for subtropical fruit. Again, your lychees, mangoes, um, avocados, macadamias, and citrus, and then also some potato and sunflower and uh, table grapes, especially between uh, the Groblersdal, Marble Hall, and uh, uh, Nablum Sprite regions. And then, of course, to round it all off, uh, KwaZulu Natal also coming in with potato production, the soybeans, maize, a lot of sugarcane, especially on the coastline, and some sugarcane in the northern parts of the country as well. And uh, then, especially important to consider for KwaZulu Natal is increasing number of macadamia and avo uh, orchards being established there as well. So, extremely wide variety of crops being cultivated all across uh, the country. If we look at hectares, it's very interesting to see that citrus is a very healthy crop in South Africa being produced just over 86,000 hectares. Apples doing very well at uh, 24,930. Table grapes, whether in the Western Cape, the Northern Cape or uh, Limpopo, doing well at 21,000 hectares. Macadamia is uh, increasing in, in its uh, production in South Africa as well. Very good competition in the export market with uh, China and Australia being our close competitors towards macadamia uh, production and export. And avocados are very important for our market. And then, of course, maize being a staple food for South Africa, we are currently cultivating in a region of 2.9 million hectares, most of which are genetically modified uh, as well the case with soybean, with uh, 700,000 hectares in the region of, uh, most of it being a Roundup Ready maize. Then wheat, uh, just over 500,000 uh, 500, hectares, as well as sunflower, a very important uh, crop in South Africa as well, at half a million hectares. And then potatoes rounding that off at 50,000. So yes, of course, there's a huge number of other crops as well, just as just an indication to you to show to you some of the major crops um, how they are doing in terms of hectares at this stage. Now, 
if we look at the agriculture in South Africa, there really is factors that's driving the biological industry and the use of bioproducts. Now, we all are aware of the pressure on the use of conventional chemistry with fewer active ingredients being allowed and the stricter residue requirements. This is especially true to the export markets. Um, and now the European Union has their own set of residue or ML, MRL rules. Uh, and in many cases, it's the specialized markets that's even more challenging with their approach towards residue um, rules and regulation that makes it so challenging for our producers. So South African export producers are uh, constantly under pressure to adhere to these uh, strict residues from um, specialized uh, um, supermarkets. Then, of course, plant resistance, uh, sorry, pest resistance management uh, plays an important role, especially when used as part of IPM strategies, integrated pest management. This is where biological products in many cases can contribute a much value. Then there's increasing consumer demand for food produced with less chemical and environmental consequences. This is not only true to, to export markets, but to some South African specialized markets as well. And then the lower risk in general that biological products um, give to humans, animals, and the environment is uh, one of the driving factors as well. In, in most cases, in general, biological products are much less um, harmful to living organisms and the environment compared to their chemical counterparts. And then of course, financial growth for many companies, for many industries um, is a source of growth of biological products. This is a way for many companies to access new markets and develop their uh, marketing strategies and commercial strategies as well. Of course, there are some perceptions towards biological products. I don't think this is only to South Africa, but to many uh, regions across the globe. Now, in the, in the past, biological products may have gained somewhat negative perception due to many different factors. It could have been in the past where you had products with bad quality formulations, non-compliance or inappropriate use not well suited to that type of biological product or that type of farming practice. But it has to be said that in recent years, uh, huge strides have been made in improving biological products to improve the quality of the formulations, the efficacy of the products, as well as the technical support that companies are providing to their clients and to make sure that these products are being applied in the optimal way and for optimal use. And it's important to consider a biological product, not just as a single product, but as a package that's being offered to the producer or the client. And that's, and you need to start off with a sound scientific foundation for your product, make sure that it's really understood how the product works in terms of its mode of action, in terms of its uh, strengths and weaknesses, to have a quality formulation with a proper QC system in place, to ensure efficacy data um, to prove that the product is working well. This is not only true from a regulatory perspective, but from a market perspective as well. In safety parameters, although biological products are much, um, uh, have fewer risks associated with them compared to conventional chemistry, it's still good to, to have the safety data and parameters in place where appropriate. Regulatory compliance, of course, is mandatory. You need to adhere to all the necessary um, uh, legislative aspects. And then pro product positioning needs to be well established. A product, a biological product needs to be user friendly to use and also needs to be practical. And then technical support is of utmost importance for any biological product, especially where some markets may be new in using or inexperienced in using biological products, having proper technical support for your product will definitely improve um, the relationship between you and your pr uh, producer or your client. So this is all aspects to keep in mind to promote biological products as a package. Now we can take a look at SABO and the biological sector. 
Um, I think if we look at the left-hand side here, this is a very good indication of the different types of biological products that you can find from bird biofertilizers, biostimulants, biopesticides, and then macroorganisms coming in uh, almost similarly as a biopesticide, as a biocontrol agent. So on the one side, you've got a lot of products that promote uh, plant growth or stimulate plant growth, plant development, uh, yield potential. There's a lot of factors that here to improve the natural process of a plant, of a crop that's um, uh, developing its yield. And there's a, a, a numerous set of uh, definitions, whether it's uh, uh, crop improvement products or biocontrol products, there, many regions around the globe has their own sets of definitions. So it's it may be in many cases difficult, especially from a regulatory perspective, to define these different types of products. But yes, there are many different types of definitions. Some are well aligned to, to literature, some maybe not so much, but it's important to get the rec correct definition for the type of product that's being discussed. And for this presentation, we are going to focus more on your biocontrol products. This will be either uh, biochemicals, microbials, or macrobials. On the biochemicals, you can find plant extracts, organic acids, semiochemicals. This is all non-living active ingredients. It can even be metabolites from um, microorganisms here that's being used for your formulation. doesn't necessarily contain a living microorganism, but the um, the um, exudates that's been produced by these organisms. And then uh, you've got your microbials that can be bacteria, fungi, viruses, protozoa, and yeasts, as an example. And then also your macroorganisms are so important, your insects and mites, even nematodes um, that's being developed uh, for biocontrol strategies. And again, there's a lot of definitions involved and this may differ um, from some regions to some regions, but it's, it still correlates pretty well to each other. Just from an international perspective, there are numerous um, biocontrol or biological associations across the globe, whether it's uh, North America in the United States. Um, there's some in Canada as well. That's maybe not on this list, but in South America, there's in Colombia and Brazil, Europe has got their own uh, biocontrol association. And then India, of course, Japan, and South Africa as well. So in South Africa, that's SABO, the South African Bioproduct Organization. And SABO, along with all these other regional biocontrol or biological associations, are all members of the global bio, uh, bioprotection global that on a global level coordinates with each other and engages with each other on matters related to bio, uh, bioprotection and biocontrol. If we look at SABO, where does SABO come from and who they are? Now, SABO was established in 2013 to represent the bioproduct industry as a whole in its dealings with local and international role players. The aim of SABO is to be recognized as a principal representative of the agricultural bioproduct industry conducting its functions with professionalism and excellence. Now, SABO has got three main objectives. The first is to promote the bioproduct industry. The second, to promote products that are developed and based on sound scientific research that are fully compliant from a regulatory perspective. And thirdly, to serve as a platform for its members to engage with relevant stakeholders. The important role that SABO fills is to be the link between government entities that's the um, DLA, DOH, and DEA, amongst others, and the bioproduct industry. It's also, maybe not mentioned here, but it's also a link between the biological industry and other uh, industry organizations, as is formed with the SAFE platform or the Strategic Agricultural Inputs Forum. So it also has a function there. Then there's a wide variety of members that's currently included within the SABO um, organization. This includes manufacturers, suppliers, and distributors of biological products, researchers, which are very, very important, and then individuals as well that are interested in biological products. Within SABO, there's an, uh, 
several working groups that's active that's where members can participate to reach uh, different goals or serve in different functions this includes the regulatory working group that's uh, focusing on regulatory matters associated with biological products and then there's also the marketing working group where members come together to promote not only the industry but also Sabo and its members. This is a, a collection of all the current members of Sabo. So there's really a wide variety of different members uh, that that can be seen here. Whether it's companies that specializing in microbial products, companies that specializing in macrobial products. There's uh, companies that specializes in seaweed-based products or other plant extracts. So it's really a huge variety and it shows the, the growth of the industry and the potential of this industry. And it is fantastic to see all these companies uh, and even research institutes, um, uh, crop growers associations, everybody coming together to work towards a common goal in promoting biological products and the bio industry. If we take a look at the biocontrol market, it's a very interesting place to be at this stage. There's a, a, a very good growth in the whole bio, biological sector at this stage, especially compared to conventional chemistry or even conventional fertilizers. If we look from an international perspective at the biocontrol market, you can see here on the left-hand side, um, the Northern, uh, North American region consisting US and Canada uh, approaches approximately $1.2 billion with their biocontrol market. Looking at South America, that's uh, up to 0.7 billion US dollars. Europe, which is a very strong contender in the biocontrol uh, market, constitutes around $1, one billion. Then the Asia Pacific region, that's growing very good at this stage, especially in countries like China and India, India with regards to biocontrol. The Asia Pacific region constitutes about half a billion US dollars. And then there's the what's uh, um, called the RAL region, that's basically Africa, Middle East and uh, parts into uh, uh, the uh, western parts of Asia as well. But it constitutes approximately 0 0.08 billion US dollars. Now, if we look at the growth, there's very good growth expected from a global perspective. Um, by 2020, the biocontrol industry alone was um, worth about 5 billion US dollars uh, with a growth of 16.5% um, there up to 2025. So by 2024, 2023, 24, we are looking at almost doubling the biocontrol industry. Now, it needs to be said that it would be interesting to see what long-term effects the COVID pandemic may have on the industry. But I think um, from a personal perspective that the agricultural sectors and especially um, sectors that's contributing towards sustainability um, are very robust at this stage. And we may see a good performance in the future. If we look at the Rao region, which constitutes Middle East Africa, South Africa really plays a significant part in this market. Uh, the total for the region is $76 million for biocontrol industry, uh, of which South Africa constitutes $26 million. So that is significant compared to, to other countries. By um, That's about 34% um, for South Africa and the growth in the region of 16.3% um, that correlates pretty well with the other regions as well and very close to the global growth uh, factor at, at this stage. So it, it's South Africa really has a strong uh, part to play in, in the biocontrol industry and it's growing at a rapid pace. If you look a bit closer at South Africa, so as mentioned, South Africa represents over one third of the African biocontrol market. Um, just to reiterate, this data is all from Dunham and Trimmer, which um, does very, very um, valuable uh, research and data collection on biocontrol as well as other bio uh, products in the industry. South Africa is a very strong 
export market with focus on fruits and vegetables and other high value crops. This is especially exported to Europe, but it's to North America as well, as well as different parts of Asia, for example, South Korea and Japan. At this stage, it would seem that bioinsector sites plays a major role in the biocontrol market in South Africa. So this is um, basically your, especially your microbial products like Bacillus thuringiensis or your uh, other um, example there is Bavaria bassiana, but then also your microbials, the, the, um, the parasitoids as well as predatory mites, for example, they are also uh, coming of age and uh, representing a bigger and bigger part of the biocontrol market. What should be remembered as well is the biofungicide uh, sector that is uh, growing significantly. This is especially based on trichoderma type products or bacillus based products, but also on products containing the metabolites from living microorganisms that can have uh, some sort of suppressing or controlling effect on uh, specific plant pathogens. But at this stage, um, biofungicides makes uh, around the region of 37% of the biocontrol market in South Africa, bioinsecticides being the most at approximately 56%. And then um, bionomaticides, which are still small, but so crucial in getting, getting right in the future, constitutes in a region of 2%. And then bioherbicides, which which would basically be the holy grail of biocontrol products. Um, it's, it's very difficult to develop these types of products and hopefully in the future, the latest uh, technology and research will give more access to bioherbicides in the future. We can only hope. Now, of course, if we look at the whole process of developing and commercializing a biological product, there's a, there's a whole array of actions that need to occur. You've got a concept that you need to research and develop. You need to understand the active substance, the mode of action, the formulation, um, get the formulation right so that the, the, the production of the formulation can be consistent batch after batch. Then there's your technical and regulatory development. And from there, you go on to your marketing and launch activities and your full commercialization. But of course, as with anything, there are challenges. From a uh, technical and regulatory perspective, there's always the challenge on uh, um, the knowledge to, to develop these types of products. The, the people that's actually um, uh, has the experience in these types of products. And then also the facilities in South Africa to test these products to analyze formulations, to analyze microbial products and so forth. There's huge challenges in South Africa with regards to capacity in testing for different types of laboratory analysis and uh, um, trials as well. And then from a regulatory perspective, there's always the challenge uh, with uh, maybe regulatory data parameters being vague or ambiguous. Um, there's always challenges between the interaction from industry and the local regulatory authority. So yes, there are numerous challenges being faced, both from a development side as well as a regulatory side. And then on the marketing and commercial side, there's always a market perception, especially with certain types of products or on certain types of crops or regions where perceptions may need some extra work compared to others. Positioning can always be a challenge with regard to positioning a biological product in an optimal manner with, um, uh, within conventional mindsets or systems and then the implementation thereof. But yeah, it's, it's these challenges that we need to face as an industry, as we need to face as academics, as we need to face as a regulatory authority, and we need to all work together to, to solve these challenges and uh, move forward with biological products. Now we take a look at the South African regulatory environment. And with biological products throughout the world, most countries will have their own specifications and requirements related to how regulation works with biological products. 
In South Africa, it is regulated. Um, it's regulated under Act 36 of 1947. And this is under the jurisdiction of the Agricultural Inputs Control from the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development. And there's really three main basic points that needs to be covered uh, within the registration process. It, it can be a very challenging, a very elongated process, but yeah, in basic terms, three aspects needs to be covered. And that's efficacy towards claims being made or the efficacy of your product that's going to be sold. Then the quality of the product needs to be proved and then safety to humans, animals, and the environment where it is, uh, when it's used as prescribed in accordance with a registered label. So that's basic, in very, very basic terms, the three main aspects that needs to be covered uh, as part of the registration process. If we look at the South African regulatory environment, you get Act 36 of 1947, that's your legislation. And this covers farm feeds and stock remedies that pertains to farm animals. You get your agricultural remedies that covers plant protection, PGR, at this stage, legume inoculants, UV protectors and desiccants. So this is where biocontrol products will be registered as agricultural or biological remedies. Then you get your fertilizers. This is products, as we all know, to, to, to provide nutrients or provide growth promotion to crops. And this can be further subdivided into group one fertilizers that are conventional fertilizers equal or greater to 100 grams per kilogram. Your group two fertilizers that are NPK fertilizers less than 100 grams per kilogram with the inclusion uh, with or without micro elements. And then also within the biological sphere, your group three biofertilizers or biostimulants um, that are distinguished from biocontrol products. So I will delve into the differences between biocontrol products and bio and group three biofertilizer biostimulants in the next slide. So what is the difference between a bio remedy where a biocontrol product will fit and a group three biofertilizer biostimulant? Because these two regions can in many cases start to get a bit gray. It can start to, to overlap a bit and it gets challenging to, to distinguish uh, some products or some active ingredients or some living organisms between the two, two sides. So on the bioremedy side, it's a product that's intended to be used for the destruction, control, propelling, attraction, or prevention of any undesired living organism, whether it's a microbe, a microbe, um, invertebrate, a vertebrate, a plant, it doesn't matter, anything that controls another population, a pest population, needs to be registered as a bioremedy, or if you're on a conventional side of things, an agricultural remedy. This is with the exception of um, active ingredients that's covered under the Medicines and Related Substances Control Act, that's Act 101, or the Hazardous Substances Act, or Act 15. These any substances that's regulated by these two acts cannot be uh, regulated by Act 36. Of course, uh, PGRs, your plant growth regulators, or any other specialized claims like UV protection and adjuvant related effects, these products also need to be registered as uh, agricultural or bioremedy. And this is where the gray area in many cases overlaps with biostimulants, especially with PGR effects. That can be quite challenging. And then at this stage, under the current legislation, legume inoculants still needs to be covered under the remedies uh, uh, regulation. And that's due to the definition being included in the Remedy Act. Um, currently, um, the process is in, in progress where the new uh, remedy regulations are being developed. So as soon as the new regulations takes effect, hopefully the legume inoculant definition can be moved to the fertilizer side which will be much more appropriate and practical to have legume inoculants under the group three biofertilizers. Now, what is a group three biofertilizer or biostimulant? As per the definition, it is a natural or synthetic substance or organisms that improves the growth or yield of plants or the physical, chemical, or biological condition of the soil. So it can be some types of soil conditioners as well. And these products serves to improve 
natural plant development and growth and or yield related parameters. So what's very important is that a group three biostimulant or fertilizer um, are not allowed to have any pest control or remedy type claims. This thing uh, will shift towards the remedy side. But yeah, it can be quite challenging. And um, that's why it's very important to have a clear, uh, or a, as best as a clear understanding of the guidelines for data requirements involved. If we look at the guideline for data requirements uh, for the registration for biological or biopesticide remedies in South Africa, this is the uh, document that you need to refer to. Um, this is the June 2015 version and can be found on the department's website. Now, this is for all types of biocontrol products, whether it's microorganisms, macroorganisms, biochemical substances of natural origin, plant-based extracts, and or metabolites. Um, there are, it, it's very important to have proper identification of active ingredients, uh, in, and then especially with relevance to living organisms, there's a requirement for import and mass release permits amongst others. For example, if you have a, a, a organism that is sourced from the local environment, you will need to refer to um, the bioprospecting permits and the requirements thereof. Then there's toxicological and environmental impact studies that's required for the active ingredients and formulation in accordance with OECD GLP guidelines. There's physical properties and storage stability, which are required for these types of products. Then uh, efficacy trials needs to be conducted to prove efficacy of the products in at least three different bioclimatic regions. If a product has residue implications, now luckily, uh, in general, biological products are exempt of residues. Uh, but let's say, for example, there were a scenario where a, a naturally a sourced active ingredient may have some sort of residue implication there will be a requirement for at least five residue studies in three different bioclimatic regions. Um, what does help uh, significantly is that there's a codex crop group um, available for data extrapolation for efficacy and residue data. So this can, can help in, in several cases. And then of course, specific label requirements play a role for biocontrol products. There's uh, a specific layout that needs to be followed. In future, it will uh, be um, a type of hybrid system with uh, GHS implications, but it needs to state how to use the product, on what crops is it registered, against what pest or pathogen is it registered, um, the dosage rates that's, that needs to be used, etc. cetera. Um, so it's very important to have a good idea of how a remedy label needs to look like in order to get the correct specifications. Um, so if one looks at this guideline, there are several challenges. I think one of the main challenges for the guideline is, is that it's very closely related to the chemical equivalent. And this can be very, very challenging for a wide variety of different bi uh, biological products. Um, so that's something that needs to, to be looked at in the future to make data requirements more applicable to biological products and their parameters. Then to summarize uh, this presentation, South Africa is a major user of biocontrol products, and that is especially true to the strong export market, but also the strong agricultural sector in South Africa. There's also a, a strong future growth that's predicted for the biocontrol sector in South Africa. SABO represents the bioproduct industry related to agricultural use in South Africa. And biological products in the country can be defined from a regulatory perspective as either bioremedies or group three biofertilizers or biostimulants. And it's very um, important to differentiate a product well between these two before registering and developing this product. Each type of registration has its own guideline towards different sets of data requirements. Biocontrol products must be registered as bioremedies. And then one must be familiarized with both types of guidelines when registering a product. Now, Sabo makes use of a regulatory working group to engage 
with the South African regulatory authorities and provide its members with a platform to interact and participate. And I think this is where a real value point with Sabo, Sabo comes in. Everybody uh, that's a Sabo member is welcome to participate. It's an open platform and it really uh, brings much value for everybody to work together in promoting a good and well-proportioned regulatory environment. Then to access guidelines, one can refer to the, the department's website. So it's on DLAR's homepage, go to branches. Um, from there, going on to agricultural production, health and food safety. That will give you the option to go to agricultural inputs control. And from there, you will be able to access all the necessary guidelines, whether it's for chemistry, biological, fertilizers, uh, residues, all the necessary guidelines will be incorporated and published on the department's website. And with that, SABO remains committed to support and promote its members and ensure prosperous bioindustry. And would like to thank you very much for your time um, and the opportunity to provide you with this uh, presentation. Thank you.